charges, the flags, the firing of guns, essentially the spectacle and noise that the Royal River was famed for. Now, I'll take you through the exhibition at a pace, because if I show you everything, we'll still be here come tea time. So um, I'll take you through at a, at a pace. Um, ask questions if you think I'm not telling you what you want to hear, and point out if I'm telling you what you don't want to hear as well. Um, <coughs> now, all exhibitions have to start somewhere in time, and perhaps arbitrarily, we've decided to start exactly 500 years ago. So we're only giving you half a millennia of history. So you know, just, just a tiny nibble of, of time to deal with. And we're starting in 1512. Now, you might think, oh, well, that's just an entirely arbitrary date. And indeed, in some respects, it is. But 1512 is an anniversary, although very few people have picked up on it this year. It's the 500th anniversary of the foundation of Woolwich Dockyard. Oh, God, a dockyard. But Okay, so um, during the medieval period, um, monarchs were often much more mobile. They had to move around the kingdom, perhaps to deal with a nobleman in revolt, or they might be at war, maybe with the French, or with the Welsh, or perhaps with the Scots. But in the Tudor period, you had relative stability in England, which essentially meant that the monarch could become much more settled. And it was around London and the Thames that the Tudors chose to make their base. Uh, so the great Riverside palaces, Greenwich where Henry VIII and Elizabeth I are born, and also up into Hampton Court and beyond Windsor became the base for the monarchy in that period. And then this coming uh, river pageantry is the first in uh, how long time? Yeah. Now, this year's river pageant really sees a return to the river on a scale that hasn't been seen for probably 350 years. The last truly magnificent river pageant took place in 1662, this amazing aqua triumphalist for Catherine of Baganza's state entry into London. Now, there were great river pageants after that, but none quite managed that scale, and this year threatens to be even greater than aqua triumphalist. And could you please name a few highlights of the exhibition finally? Now, there are a number of highlights in the exhibition. Obviously, the great Canaletto view of the Lord Mayor's River procession, an extraordinary coup to get that here in Greenwich, the first time it's been in London in 260 years. The wonderful figure of George and the Dragon, which was probably paraded with Anne Boleyn at that great triumph on the river in 1533. And of course, the magnificent stern carvings from the Royal Charles, a warship captured by the Dutch in 1667, and their return here to London for the first time in 345 years. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the reason the Thames is used for pageantry, and this room of the exhibition deals with royal pageantry on the river, is that it's essentially London's grandest estate. There is no great ceremonial route through Tudor or Stuart London on land. The streets are dirty, they are narrow, they are rather weak in, in nature. If you want to be seen by the crowd, but also to possess in style and elegance, you use the river. It's more comfortable, but it's also much wider, much grander, and offers the chance to be seen. And Henry VIII takes advantage of this fact in 1533, when his new bride, Anne Boleyn, leaves Greenwich in a spectacular river procession to Tower of London. Now, Henry is not only showing off his new bride, he's also showing off a rather controversial new queen of England. Not everyone is very happy with this fabricated divorce from Catherine of Aragon. So, now, the rest of this room looks at the Riverside palaces and the other great oil events of the river. So, the redevelopment of the palace quite on the case here, the Aqua Triumphalist of 1662. So, 350 years ago, perhaps the most spectacular royal battle ever on the Thames for Catherine of Braganza's state entry into London. <laughs> Pepys reported some 10,000 vessels on the river for this procession, and so dense were the boats, he said, I couldn't see the river for them.
Commission Christopher Wren to redesign Hampton Court for them. King William suffered from asthma and found the air at Hampton Court much more agreeable to him than the rather polluted air of London. And while waiting for the buildings to be complete, Queen Mary chose to live in the water gallery at Hampton Court, the old buildings where royal barges would arrive to the palace. And she had it redesigned by the French designer Daniel Marot in a blue and white theme emulating her interests in Delftware. And there are a group of putti in this tile doing either something quite unspeakable or something perfectly innocent. I can't quite decide what. <laughs> annually we've returned again to the Lord Mayor's procession and this room of the exhibition deals with this annual pageant which takes place on the river each year between 1453 and 1856 so you have more than 400 years of Lord Mayor's processions example, are the carvings from the Fishmongers Company barge of 1773 the Fishmongers one of the wealthiest of the city companies and Clearly, the merchant tailors felt that these carvings were rather better than their own carvings, so in 1800 they outdid them here with their magnificent gilded decorations. And you didn't expect to see a pair of rampant camels in the National Maritime Museum, where we have the ships of the desert here <laughs> for you. And in this case, you get a sense of the sort of colour and splendour of these um, great pageants. Outfits for the barge master and the oarsman, trumpet banners at the back, all decorated with various symbols of the companies. So bands of musicians on board, saluting guns to be fired to, to signal your arrival and departure. And also here in the centre, this enormous ewer from the armourer's company bar barge. And this would have been filled, we suspect, with either very strong ale or grog. A mixture of rum and water to sustain the weary oarsmen as they went up and down the Thames. I have to tell you that the return from Westminster to the city was often a much more boisterous of the company, not St Ostrich at the end, I'll come to him in a minute. Um, <laughs> and these were not simply barge decorations but often took part in the pageant that ran alongside the procession. So playwrights would write a drama to be performed as part of the procession with various performances on land as the livery companies paraded to the quayside but also on the water at various stages along the processional route and some of these have connections with the various companies so here is St Lawrence the patron saint of the ironmongers company now, why is, why St Lawrence? Yes, because he was barbecued to death <laughs> on an iron grill, oh, so yeah. rather grisly connection with yeah. the various companies. I mean, St Peter for the fishmongers makes a little more sense, like Simon the fisherman, fisherman yeah. Yeah. and St Dunstan, resplendent in guilt there, is for the goldsmiths, and St Dunstan took part in metalworking as well as being Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, what is the ostrich doing at the end? Well, he's also from the Ironmongers Company, dates from 1629, the ostrich, and it was believed that ostriches could eat iron. So he's in fact got a horseshoe in his mouth. So another tangential connection with the, with the company there. I don't know what part he played in the pageants. I don't know whether he had a speaking role. But <laughs> anyway, there he is as a sort of bizarre connection with the, with the Ironmongers decided to turn their barge master's badges into other things. And we've got three examples here of quite enormous tabletop snuff boxes that they've <laughs> been turned into. And the one for the haberdashers company, I have to tell you, has a snuff container inside of epic proportions. It must hold more than a pound of snuff. So um, the haberdashers had some serious snuff addicts amongst their members, I think. Place for 
leisure and entertainment, and also explore in greater depth one of the royal residences on the Thames, that of Kew Palace, which becomes a favourite of the royal family. And here we have, in her gilded magnificence, Queen Charlotte from the figurehead of the royal yacht, Royal Charlotte, which in the early 19th century was one of five royal yachts based here at Greenwich. Now, shortly after this yacht was built, she was broken up because the government decided to cut back on the number of royal yachts cheat in the Georgian period. Somewhere out of the hustle and bustle of London, a sort of rural idyll where the family can indulge their interests in simple domestic life. George III and Queen Charlotte, you will remember, had 15 children. So there was quite a bit of domestic life to be enjoyed or endured, but they did have many servants to help them with the royal children. And you can see three particularly ugly specimens in the very large Benjamin West there. Um, but life at Kew was not simply a domestic Now, you will doubtless all groan at the prospect of hearing about Nelson in Greenwich, um, but I'm afraid it's compulsory. We have to do it soon there. Um, Nelson's great funeral in January 1806 also exploited the Thames appropriately for a sailor um, as part of the great funeral procession, initially on water from Greenwich to Whitehall and then on land from Whitehall to St Paul's Cathedral. And here we have the apotheosis of Nelson. Neptune representing the Navy carrying <coughs> Nelson's body into the arms of Britannia representing the nation with victory looking on. Two cherubs neatly disguising the fact that Nelson has lost his right arm. Here is the great river parade the gilded barges bedecked in black. Here are some of the flags that were flown and a rather fanciful representation of Nelson's funeral barge, a royal barge that George III gave permission to be used. Now, also in this section, we look at the people who made the Thames work. In other words, the water. Before 1750, there was only one bridge across the Thames in London, and that was London Bridge. So if you really wanted to get north to south, or even east to west, in comfort and speed, you use the water to, in many respects, a national river as well. It becomes a centre for the Royal Navy. It's important to have the Navy stationed on the Thames, because the last thing you want is the enemy fleet to sail up the Thames and capture the capital. But of course, enemy fleets do get quite close to the capital, which is where these magnificent stern carvings come in. These are carvings from the Royal Charles, and they have been in the Netherlands since 1667. So we've waited 345 years to get them back here to London. Now, what is their significance? Well, the Royal Charles was launched as a ship called the Naseby during the Commonwealth period. But it was chosen to be Charles II's flagship, the ship that would take him back from exile in Holland in 1660. And at once he had the offending figurehead of Oliver Cromwell chopped off the front of the ship, <laughs> and he renamed the ship Royal Charles, and it became His Majesty's flagship and was the ship that took Catherine of Braganza from Portugal to England in 1662 to marry the king. Now, in 1667, having served well during the Dutch War, this ship is safely moored at Chatham, out of reach of the Dutch, or so they thought, with only 30 of its 80 guns mounted and not very many people on board, when the Dutch appear over the horizon and it has been in the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam since the 19th century, and this is the first time it has ever left the Netherlands. So it's quite cool to get that here. No, not forever, no, no, I'm afraid we 
we have to consider when we get back to them. I think that's yeah. it. In charge of the fleet at the time is James, Duke of York, Lord High Admiral. This is not his Lord High Admiral's uniform. Um, it hardly strike fear into the enemy wearing that. This is him <laughs> dressed as March, the Roman god of war. The builder of the ship, Peter Pett, who is in charge of the dockyard at Chatham when the raid takes place. And their naval careers never really quite recovered from, from that affair. The Scottish curator is George IV's visit to Scotland in 1822. The watercolour at the back of the cage shows the extraordinary scene here at Greenwich when he left by Royal Yacht to go to Edinburgh. The whole affair was stage managed by Walter Scott and the Tour of Scotland enormously successful. And not have this second meeting at Greenwich and it tells you something about the river at the time. She immediately gets on the Royal train and goes directly to Windsor. So again, you can see how technology and transport changes are affecting the use of, of the Royal River. So how do we connect this back to the river? Well, aha, on the evening of her marriage, a huge crowd gathers on London Bridge to celebrate the, the marriage. And here in Pullman Hunt's great depiction of the event, you see the crowd surging across the bridge, the Danish flags flying in the background in an atmosphere closer to Valhalla, I think, than uh, the Victoria in London. And then finally, and I will shut up, you'll be delighted to hear, um, behind you, we look at the royal yachts, the great floating palaces of state. The Winterhalter portrait of the young Prince of Wales with the very uniform he is wearing in the portrait of him. And you see the interiors of some of the yachts. Prince Albert chose the chintz for the um, Queen Victoria's bedroom, not quite to everyone's taste, certainly not to mine, but there it is, um, a pink chintz bedroom. The large royal standard from the Royal Yacht of Victoria and Albert III, and then what I like to call the collapse of royal taste afloat. In other words, the sort of tableware that the royal family used while on the Royal Yachts, I think Queen Victoria's taste perhaps the least satisfactory. However, also here, Queen Mary's electric air tom heaters and George V's electric cigar lighter. So whatever you think of royal taste afloat, um, they did at least have the latest technology available to them. I could have coped with the uh, writing of the labels for all of that. We have been extremely lucky with this. The opening of the National Maritime Museum in 1937, when the King and Queen came downriver by motor launch with the 11 year old Princess Elizabeth for a birthday treat in April 1937. <coughs> but we also have footage of the return of Britannia in 1954. And it's on this screen that we will bring things fully up to date with footage of this June's river pageant. So you will sort of go full circle from Anne Boleyn at the very beginning to the present queen here at the end, a sort of seamless story of, of river pageantry.